Chapter six of Prester John. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Prester John by John Buchan. Chapter six. The drums beat at sunset. Jap was drunk for the next day or two, and I had the business of the store to myself. I was glad of this, for it gave me leisure to reflect upon the various perplexities of my situation. As I have said, I was really scared, more out of a sense of impotence than from dread of actual danger. I was in a fog of uncertainty. Things were happening around me which I could only dimly guess at, and I had no power to take one step in defence. That Wardlaw should have felt the same without any hint from me was the final proof that the mystery was no figment of my nerves. I had written to Collis and got no answer. Now the letter with Jap's resignation in it had gone to Durban. Surely some notice would be taken of that. If I was given the post, Collis was bound to consider what I had said in my earlier letter, and give me some directions. Meanwhile it was my business to stick to my job till I was relieved. A change had come over the place during my absence. The natives had almost disappeared from sight, except the few families living round Blau Wildebeestfontein. One never saw a native on the roads, and none came into the store. They were sticking close to their locations, or else they had gone after some distant business. Except a batch of three Shangons returning from the Rand, I had nobody in the store for the whole of one day. So about four o'clock I shut it up, whistled to Colin, and went for a walk along the berg. If there were no natives on the road, there were plenty in the bush. I had the impression, of which Wardlaw has spoken, that the native population of the countryside had suddenly been hugely increased. The woods were simply hotching with them. I was being spied on as before, but now there were so many at the business that they could not all conceal their tracks. Every now and then I had a glimpse of a black shoulder or leg, and Colin, whom I kept on the leash, was half mad with excitement. I had seen all I wanted, and went home with a preoccupied mind. I sat long on Wardlaw's garden seat, trying to puzzle out the truth of this spying. What perplexed me was that I had been left unmolested when I had gone to Umpolos. Now, as I conjectured, the secret of the neighborhood, whatever it was, was probably connected with the Rurarand, but when I had ridden in that direction, and had spent two days in exploring, no one had troubled to watch me. I was quite certain about this, for my eye had grown quick to note espionage, and it is harder for a spy to hide in the spare bush of the flats than in the dense thickets of these uplands. The watchers then did not mind my fossicking round their sacred place, why then was I so closely watched in the harmless neighbourhood of the store? I thought for a long time before an answer occurred to me. The reason must be that going to the plains I was going into native country and away from civilization. But Blau Wildebeestfontein was near the frontier. There must be some dark business brewing of which they may have feared that I had an inkling. They wanted to see if I proposed to go to Petersdorp or Wesselsburg and tell what I knew, and they clearly were resolved that I should not. I laughed, I remember, thinking that they had forgotten the post-bag, but then I reflected that I knew nothing of what might be happening daily to the post-bag. When I had reached this conclusion, my first impulse was to test it by riding straight west on the main road. If I was right, I should certainly be stopped. On second thoughts, however, this seemed to me to be flinging up the game prematurely, and I resolved to wait a day or two before acting. Next day nothing happened save that my sense of loneliness increased. I felt that I was being hemmed in by barbarism, and cut off in a ghoulish land from the succour of my own kind. I only kept my courage up by the necessity of presenting a brave face to Mr. Wardlaw, who was by this time in a very broken condition of nerves. I had often thought that it was my duty to advise him to leave, and to see him safely off, but I shrank from severing myself from my only friend. I thought, too, of the few Dutch farmers within riding distance, and had half a mind to visit them, but they were far over the plateau, and could know little of my anxieties. The third day events moved faster. Jap was sober and wonderfully quiet. 
he gave me good morning quite in a friendly tone and set to posting up the books as if he had never misbehaved in his days i was so busy with my thoughts that i too must have been gentler than usual and the morning passed like a honeymoon till i went across to dinner i was just sitting down when i remembered that i had left my watch in my waistcoat behind the counter and started to go back for it but at the door i stopped short for two horsemen had drawn up before the store one was a native with what i took to be saddle-bags the other was a small slim man with a sun-helmet who was slowly dismounting something in the cut of his jib struck me as familiar i slipped into the empty schoolroom and stared hard then as he half turned in handing his bridle to the kaffir i got a sight of his face it was my former shipmate enriquez he said something to his companion and entered the store you may imagine that my curiosity ran to fever heat my first impulse was to march over for my waistcoat and make a third with Jap at the interview. Happily I reflected in time that Enriquez knew my face, for I had grown no beard, having a great dislike to needless hair. If he was one of the villains in the drama, he would mark me down for his vengeance once he knew I was here, whereas at present he had probably forgotten all about me. Besides, if I walked in boldly I would get no news. If Jap and he had a secret, they would not blab it in my presence my next idea was to slip in by the back to the room i had once lived in but how was i to cross the road it ran white and dry some distance each way in full view of the kaffir with the horses further the store stood on a bare patch and it would be a hard job to get in by the back assuming as i believed that the neighbourhood was thick with spies the upshot was that i got my glasses and turned them on the store the door was open and so was the window in the gloom of the interior i made out enriquez legs he was standing by the counter and apparently talking to jap he moved to shut the door and came back inside my focus opposite the window there he stayed for maybe ten minutes while i hugged my impatience i would have given a hundred pounds to be snug in my old room with jap thinking me out of the store suddenly the legs twitched up and his boots appeared above the counter jap had invited him to his bedroom and the game was now to be played beyond my ken this was more than i could stand so i stole out at the back door and took to the thickest bush on the hillside my notion was to cross the road half a mile down where it had dropped into the defile of the stream and then to come swiftly up the edge of the water so as to effect a back entrance into the store as fast as i dared i tore through the bush and in about a quarter of an hour had reached the point i was making for then i bore down to the road and was in the scrub about ten yards off it when the clatter of horses pulled me up again peeping out i saw that it was my friend and his kaffir follower who were riding at a very good pace for the plains toilfully and crossly i returned on my tracks to my long delayed dinner whatever the purport of their talk jap and the portuguese had not taken long over it in the store that afternoon i said casually to jap that i had noticed visitors at the door during my dinner hour the old man looked me frankly enough in the face yes it was mr hendricks he said and explained that the man was a portuguese trader from delagoa way who had a lot of kaffir stores east of the labombo hills i asked his business and was told that he always gave jap a call in when he was passing do you take every man that calls into your bedroom and shut the door i asked jap lost colour and his lip trembled i swear to god mr crawford i've been doing nothing wrong i've kept the promise i gave you like an oath to my mother i see you suspect me and maybe you've cause but i'll be quite honest with you i have dealt in diamonds before this with hendricks but to-day when he asked me i told him that that business was off i only took him to my room to give him a drink he likes brandy and there's no supply in the shop i distrusted jap wholeheartedly enough but i was convinced that in this case he spoke the truth had the man any news i asked he had and he hadn't said jap he was always a sullen beggar and never spoke much 
but he said one queer thing he asked me if i was going to retire and when i told him yes he said i had put it off rather long i told him i was as healthy as i ever was and he laughed in his dirty portugoose way yes mr japp he says but the country is not so healthy i wonder what the chap meant he'll be dead of blackwater before many months to judge by his eyes this talk satisfied me about japp who was clearly in desperate fear of offending me and disinclined to return for the present to his old ways but i think the rest of the afternoon was the most wretched time in my existence it was as plain as daylight that we were in for some grave trouble trouble to which i believed that i alone held any kind of clue i had a pile of evidence the visit of enriquez was the last bit which pointed to some great secret approaching its disclosure i thought that that disclosure meant blood and ruin but i knew nothing definite if the commander of a british army had come to me then and there and offered help i could have done nothing only asked him to wait like me the peril whatever it was did not threaten me only though i and wardlaw and Jap might be the first to suffer but i had a terrible feeling that i alone could do something to ward it off and just what that something was i could not tell i was horribly afraid not only of unknown death but of my impotence to play any manly part i was alone knowing too much and yet too little and there was no chance of help under the broad sky i cursed myself for not writing to aitken at lorenzo markish weeks before he had promised to come up and he was the kind of man who kept his word in the late afternoon i dragged wardlaw out for a walk in his presence i had to keep up a forced cheerfulness and i believe the pretence did me good we took a path up the berg among groves of stinkwood and essenwood where a falling stream made an easy route it may have been fancy but it seemed to me that the wood was emptier and that we were followed less closely i remember it was a lovely evening and in the clear fragrant gloaming every foreland of the berg stood out like a great ship above the dark green sea of the bush when we reached the edge of the plateau we saw the sun sinking between two far blue peaks in Makapan's country and away to the south the great roll of the high veldt i longed miserably for that country where white men were thronged together in dorps and cities as we gazed a curious sound struck our ears it seemed to begin far up in the north a low roll like the combing of breakers on the sand then it grew louder and travelled nearer a roll with sudden spasms of harsher sound in it reminding me of the churning in one of the potholes of kirkcaple cliffs presently it grew softer again as the sound passed south but new notes were always emerging the echo came sometimes as it were from stark rock and sometimes from the deep gloom of the forests i have never heard an eerier sound neither natural nor human it seemed but the voice of that world between which is hid from man's sight and hearing mr wardlaw clutched my arm and in that moment i guessed the explanation the native drums were beating passing some message from the far north down the line of the berg where the locations were thickest to the great black populations of the south but that means war mr wardlaw cried it means nothing of the kind i said shortly it's their way of sending news it's as likely to be some change in the weather or an outbreak of cattle disease when we got home i found jap with a face like grey paper did you hear the drums he asked yes i said shortly what about them god forgive you for an ignorant britisher he almost shouted you may hear drums any night but a drumming like that i only once heard before it was in seventy nine in the zeti valley do you know what happened next day setawayo's impis came over the hills and in an hour there wasn't a living white soul in the glen two men escaped and one of them was called peter japp we are in god's hands then and must wait on his will i said solemnly there was no more sleep for wardlaw and myself that night we made the best barricade we could of the windows 
loaded all our weapons and trusted to colin to give us early news before supper i went over to get japp to join us but found that that worthy had sought help from his old protector the bottle and was already sound asleep with both door and window open i had made up my mind that death was certain and yet my heart belied my conviction and i could not feel the appropriate mood if anything i was more cheerful since i had heard the drums it was clearly now beyond the power of me or any man to stop the march of events my thoughts ran on a native rising and i kept telling myself how little that was probable where were the arms the leader the discipline at any rate such arguments put me to sleep before dawn and i wakened at eight to find that nothing had happened the clear morning sunlight as of old made blau wildebeestfontein the place of a dream zita brought in my cup of coffee as if this day were just like all others my pipe tasted as sweet the fresh air from the burg blew as fragrantly on my brow i went over to the store in reasonably good spirits leaving wardlaw busy on the penitential psalms the post-runner had brought the mail as usual and there was one private letter for me i opened it with great excitement for the envelope bore the stamp of the firm at last collis had deigned to answer inside was a sheet of the firm's note-paper with the signature of collis across the top but some one had pencilled these five words the bless box are changing ground i looked to see that japp had not suffocated himself then shut up the store and went back to my room to think out this new mystification the thing had come from collis for it was the private note-paper of the durban office and there was collis signature but the pencilling was in a different hand my deduction from this was that some one wished to send me a message and that collis had given that some one a sheet of signed paper to serve as a kind of introduction i might take it therefore that the scribble was collis reply to my letter now my argument continued if the unknown person saw fit to send me a message it could not be merely one of warning collis must have told him that i was awake to some danger and as i was in blau wildebeestfontein i must be nearer the heart of things than any one else the message must therefore be in the nature of some password which i was to remember when i heard it again i reasoned the whole thing out very clearly and i saw no gap in my logic i cannot describe how that scribble had heartened me i felt no more the crushing isolation of yesterday there were others beside me in the secret help must be on the way and the letter was the first tidings but how near that was the question and it occurred to me for the first time to look at the postmark i went back to the store and got the envelope out of the waste-paper basket the postmark was certainly not durban the stamp was a cape colony one and of the mark i could only read three letters t r s this was no sort of clue and i turned the thing over completely baffled then i noticed that there was no mark of the post town of delivery our letters to blau wildebeestfontein came through petersdorp and bore that mark i compared the envelope with others they all had a circle and petersdorp in broad black letters but this envelope had nothing except the stamp i was still slow at detective work and it was some minutes before the explanation flashed on me the letter had never been posted at all the stamp was a fake and had been borrowed from an old envelope there was only one way in which it could have come it must have been put in the letter-bag while the postman was on his way from petersdorp my unknown friend must therefore be somewhere within eighty miles of me i hurried off to look for the post-runner but he had started back an hour before there was nothing for it but to wait on the coming of the unknown that afternoon i again took mr wardlaw for a walk it is an ingrained habit of mine that i never tell any one more of a business than is practically necessary for months i had kept all my knowledge to myself and breathed not a word to a soul but i thought it my duty to tell wardlaw about the letter to let him see that we were not forgotten i am afraid it did not encourage his mind 
occult messages seemed to him only the last proof of a deadly danger encompassing us and i could not shake his opinion we took the same road to the crown of the berg and i was confirmed in my suspicion that the woods were empty and the watchers gone the place was as deserted as the bush at umbolos when we reached the summit about sunset we waited anxiously for the sound of drums it came as we expected louder and more menacing than before wardlaw stood pinching my arm as the great tattoo swept down the escarpment and died away in the far mountains beyond the oliphants yet it no longer seemed to be a wall of sound shutting us out from our kindred in the west a message had pierced the wall if the blesbach were changing ground i believed the hunters were calling out their hounds and getting ready for the chase End of chapter six